Welcome to Building the Jungle Gem. I'm J.A. Michaelene. I'm a writer, critic, and editor, and I'm really excited to moderate this panel um, with all four of these fine people about um, structures and signifiers in Kip's comics. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. So the last 10 minutes are going to be available for questions for you guys. Um, so the way it's going to work is there are going to be two microphones set up kind of in the back there. So if you guys want to queue up or line up, um, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible so we can have a great conversation. So we'll kick it off with Molly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for putting this together. Um, I'm Molly Knox Ostertag. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the artist and author of The Witch Boy, which is a middle grade book out from Scholastic last year. Uh, it has a sequel coming out in a month called The Hidden Witch. Um, I'm also known for the webcomic Strong Female Protagonist, um, the graphic novel Shattered Warrior, um, and a few other things. But The Witch Boy is my main uh, work for kids. Um, hi, um, my name's Shannon Wright. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently um, illustrating my first graphic novel, Twins, that's coming out through Arthur A. Levine Books. Um, I have a new comic at my table at E11. <laughs> um, Castor and Karina, it's um, a story about these two uh, dragon twins um, trying to get some galactic burgers since their mom, <laughs> since their mom was like, no, I worked a double, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Gail Galligan. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. And I am currently adapting the Babysitter's Club books, numbers <laughs> five through eight. The most recent one, Chrissy's Big Day, just came out like two weeks ago. And I also draw Garfield fan comics sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hi, um, I'm Benji Nate, and uh, I uh, she, her pronouns. And I draw the comic Catboy, which was originally on Vice and now published through Silver Sprocket. Uh, I also draw lots of other web comics, and Catboy Volume 2 is coming out next year. Yay. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have mentioned my pronouns are she, her as well. So let's get started. Um, so I think there's this misconception about work for children that it's the same as work for adults, except stripped of swears and sexual gratuity. And some of this is probably true in the way that I think that usually what's meant there is that we ought to assume that children are just as perceptive as adults, equally complex, equally smart. Um, and much of the most successful children's fiction, like My Neighbor Totoro, Steven Universe, absolutely deals with the same complex issues that we deal with or see in adult fiction. Mm -hmm. But I like to talk about what to you makes a children's comic, like what artistic or narrative choices signify a work for children. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think most successful children's works are told through the perspective of a child. Mm -hmm. And whether there's violence in it or not, I think that's like a key important factor in children's comics. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's very rare for a children's comic to be about um, just an adult, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I'd also add that I feel like um, children's comics tend to focus visually on um, clarity above all, mm -hmm. um, communicating um, as clearly as possible um, a concept and idea, and making sure that um, the person reading can make it from panel to panel, like yeah. above anything else. Yeah, I would also um, add it definitely puts an emphasis on like that emotion the child is feeling in that moment. Um, again, you mentioned My Neighbor Totoro. There were just so many emotions that um, all those characters went through like in a matter of seconds. And I just remember being a child, getting good news, and my like range of emotion went from like zero to 100. <laughs> and it was like hard to process, but like being able to illustrate that in kids' media, like kids relate to that so well. Like you get a bad report card, um, you go through the shock first, and then there's this dread, and you're like you got to go home now. And you're like, oh god. <laughs> and then just like happy news, like oh you got into, I don't know what kids are getting into, like oh, competitions. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> like you got chosen, and it's just like wow, like I did that, and it's just like the emotion um, you emote definitely comes through in like kids' work that I love. So. Yeah, there's this excitement of so many uh, emotions, like you're feeling it for the first time, or mm -hmm. like you're having these first time experiences that I think can be really powerful. I definitely, um, I think a lot of kids' content exists in this like space where it's like this perfectly safe world that is like for children. And I'm, I'm very interested in making work where it's like, because like, I think like that's not true. Like kids mm -hmm. do live in the adult world. Like you, you, even when you're young, your lives intersect with like yeah. these like bigger adult concepts. And so I'm really interested in like, 
exploring those, but from the perspective of someone uh, mm -hmm. younger. Yeah. Um, and also like in fantasy, I think something that I think is like special to kids comics is these like really aspirational figures, um, like older kids or people mm -hmm. who are just kind of like cool or magical or exciting or heroic in a way that you look at and you're like, I want to like be them or I want to like, you know, be friends with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you guys think that impacts like the way that you actually draw your work? Because it sounds like there's a lot of emphasis on complex emotions. So how does that translate into the shapes of your characters or like the way that your panels lay out? Is there any impact you think at all about the way you think about how your comics are built? Yeah, um, I would definitely say when a new like emotion is being introduced, I tend to like take that whole panel to just focus on that expression instead of um, having so much detail. Like it's great to like step back and you just have a zoomed in shot of your character going through happiness or sadness. And um, I see a lot of it in, I, I, we talk about this a lot, I see a lot of it in manga where you take that step back to put an emphasis on um, a new character being introduced or a new emotion or a new feeling or anything like that. And I notice a lot of kids work again takes a step back to just like put an emphasis on that. Yeah, like you want to you want to give the reader a moment to linger yeah. on that and say this is important. This is what you want to see and feel. You know? mm -hmm. I think and, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I think Gail really hit the nail on the head when you were talking about clarity. Mm -hmm. Like I think that is the most like that's the biggest like uh, design thing <laughs> that's important in children's comics. Yeah. Which is like I think it, I think it should be important in every comic. Yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> there's a problem where adults don't necessarily know how to get into comics because they don't know where to start or how yeah. to read them. Yeah. Right. And the just yeah. kids comics. Yeah. <laughs> they solved it. That's true. <laughs> People like to like infer a lot and it's like maybe we should just get some clarity first and then <laughs> go from there. Like build up. Don't get too fancy. Yeah, don't get yeah. too fancy. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like when I think about what I loved as a kid, I really responded to stories. And like whether I was like reading a book and imagining it or like watching a movie and then thinking about it later, like it was just, I wanted to live in the story. So yeah, I think like having the story be really clear and like for me, all, again, with like sort of fantasy books, like having a setting that you want to escape into or like um, just like this kind of like, I, I would, I just would love these sort of like beautiful images, like um, anything from Miyazaki where you mm -hmm. just, want to go live in that world yeah. uh, really right. deeply. I know I'm already veering off of the path of like the <laughs> things that we already said we were gonna talk mm -hmm. about, but um, I'm really interested in it because it sounds like we're all agreeing that clarity seems to be mm -hmm. a very key tenet um, in children's comics, mm -hmm. but that clarity also is important in pretty much every comic mm -hmm. because it's unreadable. If it's unreadable, <laughs> then it's not any more useful for adults. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. Right. So how would you guys think about conveying ambiguity in children's comics if clarity is a big part of that? I think that like I found that young readers are really comfortable with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, I think not. I think you want to be able to read the story and like get the narrative out of it, mm -hmm. but also to be like. I mean, it's like you don't get things when you're an adult either. But when you're a kid, it's like so much of the world is this huge mystery, and mm -hmm. so having these big things in the story that it doesn't all have to be spelled out. Like, yeah. That's right. like the thing that yeah. keeps me the most is seeing like like work for children that is like sort of talks down to kids and is like mm -hmm. everything has to be explained. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I think the nice thing about like kids works and work work for kids rather is that there is um, this process that kids go through when they read a book where it's just, yes, this is the world. I accept <laughs> this and will continue. Like if it's an adult, you might want to explain it to them a few times. Like this is the structure of the world and here is exactly how it works. A kid will just say, yes, of course you want to ride dragon and go on yeah. from there. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, I always yeah. remember like reading Harry Potter as the, like American and I couldn't tell the difference between like the British things and the magic things right. but I just was <laughs> taking it all yeah. say all like like yeah <laughs> That's true yeah So for you Benji in particular but I want to hear from the whole group um, I wanted to get your perspective because I think you end up using a lot of these children signifiers in your work um, and but your work is also kind of related to adult audiences for the most yeah. part, especially because it appears in Vice, which is mostly read by adults, oh, I yeah. would assume. Mm -hmm. Very adult. Um, <laughs> but so how do these signifiers fit into what you convey? And then for the rest of you also, I think I would love to hear about what you guys think the significance of is, is when you use children's symbols in adult work, and maybe a little bit vice versa. I think, um, well, when I think about like all ages work being made by adults, 
it feels like a lot of it is through like a nostalgic lens. Mm -hmm. It's it's adults putting nostalgia out, like their nostalgia out there for children, mm -hmm. but clearly they're making work that they like making mm -hmm. and with this view. And it feels weird that we don't have a lot of adult work where it has that nostalgic lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, adults clearly like children's things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Steven Universe is widely popular with like uh, like 20 something year olds. Mm -hmm. People love it and it's because like, looks the way it does mm -hmm. and they like it's an, it's nostalgic for them with all the like uh, the shoujo references yeah like, people like it like yeah. um yeah it just it seems to make like especially like i'm working on comics that are a little bit grittier than catboy but mm -hmm. i still use a lot of like that imagery and i think it's i think people like it because of the way it looks like i think it re like it relates something to them yeah an era of childhood yeah, but it's, also, it's, yeah, it's still like digestible. Like yeah, exactly. I, yeah. yeah, like it pulls you in, and that's a surprise. You know? mm -hmm. It's like candy, and then you find out it's actually coffee. <laughs> You're like, oh no! That's how I got into coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I took that sweet candy. Like this chocolate covered uh, coffee beans. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there is like a purity to that kind of art where I feel like, because I do a webcomic that's pretty adult as well, and I've found my style changing as I've like mm -hmm. started to do more kids' books, but I'm still drawing this webcomic. Um, but I think like with adult work, there is this like, I have to have this extra like almost cynical layer of thought of like, how will this be interpreted? How can I like mess with the expectation in some way? How can I like add these like gritty elements of reality so that it doesn't feel too artificial? Um, and it's like really kind of nice and freeing with kids work to feel like I can just make this like really pure. Like mm -hmm. if I want something to be beautiful, I can just draw it to be beautiful. Yeah. If I want it to be scary, I can make it scary. And I don't have to really, there's no like winkiness to the audience. Like I'm just presenting the story mm -hmm. and the emotions. Yeah. yeah. Like, I guess it's kind of like um, why people are getting into stuff like the Great British Bake Off almost. Oh, it's like, it just feels yeah. nice. Yeah. 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 I think especially if you think about like manga, mm -hmm. like so much of that is for adults mm -hmm. and it looks the same as like the, the children's manga does. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they've really figured it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they nailed it. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Yeah. We're getting there. We're trying. Yeah. <laughs> I think that gets into um, the next thing that we were going to talk about, which is kind of the limiting factor of the lens. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the internet, it's a little bit different because depending on children's access to the internet, they can directly find materials mm -hmm. and there's no need to filter yeah. through their parents. Yeah. But um, while it's true that A, it's filtered through adults in the way that adults are making this mm -hmm. material for the most part, so we're already getting a child's perspective still filtered from an adult. And then, usually the person that's deciding kind of what a children's comic is, is yeah. a parent, a yeah. teacher, a librarian, who is probably an adult, but I would love to find out if they are not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, I th was wondering if you guys feel like, and or just thinking in general, like, does this limit our signifiers? Because we're all kind of cycling, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. we have ideas of what children's comics are, mm -hmm. that then have to look the way that a children's comic does in order for an adult to recognize it and then hand it to a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to expand beyond these signifiers, and should we? Or, I don't know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think just naturally as this um, area of the market continues to grow and we get more and more work out there, um, the breadth of work available to us will continue to expand. Mm -hmm. um, just because, um, like, the, the, the more we have this um, core set of signifiers that everybody expects to understand, the more we can add a little bit more. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I'm of the opinion that a lot of uh, work that isn't labeled all ages should just be given to children. Right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, like Catboy, a, a conventional publisher would not market that as all ages, but there's just a, like a, a couple scenes of drinking and most adults don't mind giving that to their children. Mm -hmm. It's also scenes where they drink and don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. But um, yeah, no, I think one of the things that, I, that we should start doing is not dumb things down for kids. Yeah. Like, they know things. Yeah. Um, and it would, there's something about adult work written for adults. Like, it, like you don't have to do anything special. You're yeah. comfortable. Like, we need to have that same level of comfort in yeah. like children's comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, touching on what you said about um, like we don't need to like dumb down um, 
this information we put to kids. I, I've done some like teaching with like high schoolers and I've done some like taught soccers with like younger kids. And I can't say this enough, but like kids are very intelligent and they're very smart and they're just like their parents and just like their guardians and the people um, older than them, they're going through the same things. Um, like if you're going, as a parent, if you're going through something in your household, your child is also going through that. So expect them to feel that sadness or loneliness or confusion. And I think it's where like robbing them of that emotion and that um, ability to express that and see that stuff in work, if we just take it out because we wanna protect them all the time. Um, kids need an outlet to feel that emotion if they're going through a divorce or if they're going through like a death in the family. And um, yeah, I think we're doing a disservice if we're taking all of that stuff out to um, keep this t um, type of purity. Um, I know everyone, like everyone's childhood is different and I know definitely like at 12, I knew about a lot of stuff and there are some forms of media, again, like parents are free to let their kids choose what they wanna read, but there is definitely some media that I didn't, res I didn't see my life story reflected in it. Um, I was just like, oh, why is no one talking about like separation or divorce or like death? And it's just like, as a kid, I would have loved to have like that sort of comfort in like my media, so. Mm -hmm. Why a lot of us found a lot of comfort in manga is because yeah. they don't shy away from stuff like yeah. that at all. <laughs> yeah. And it's very open about those subjects mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. pandering to yeah. children. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I do think that like adults often want to tie things in bows mm -hmm. and to be like like in adult fiction they're like I fully understand everything and it resolves at the end and I think it yeah it's like this it's underestimation of, mm -hmm. of kids to be like you live with so much uncertainty all the time yeah. and you are not in control of your life and you do not know how things are mm -hmm. like the, how the world is and we do forget what that felt like because yeah. we're grown but yeah. It, yeah to be like you can linger in that space of uncertainty yeah. and that yeah. won't make it a bad story or unsatisfying. Yeah. In yeah. fact, it is like really relatable. Yeah, yeah like it, it is really heartening to see work like um, Sunny Side Up, um, which mm -hmm. is like the story about a girl whose brother is going through a hard time and how yeah. she personally is dealing with that. Yeah. Um, or um, Jared Krasowska's um, Hey Kiddo is coming yeah. out soon and that, that dives into a lot of the subjects we're talking about. Yeah. And I think if we can like, um, like prove that these are helpful and mm -hmm. successful, we yeah. can get more of it. Yeah, exactly. I think we're still kind of going between the clarity, complexity, oh, tension. No, which is, no, I <laughs> yeah. think it's great because I think that's kind of the theme of what I think people find so difficult about comparing adult fiction mm -hmm. and children's or why or middle grade or however you want to decide. Mm -hmm. Children, like how, how far do we go? How yeah. much do we pull back? And I realized that um, I actually asked you guys to send images in about mm -hmm. your own work, and I wanted to talk a little bit because we're talking about the signifiers, but we haven't actually mm -hmm. talked specifically. Yeah. What are the signifiers for you? How do you specifically communicate to an audience, this is for children? Like, what do you do in your drawings? Is it a specific, specific shape? Is it mm -hmm. layouts? Like, what do you do with your layouts? Those kinds of things. I know we have some images that I can mm -hmm. kind of click through, Hello. and we can see Gail Galligan's <laughs> Babysitter's <Gail>. Club. <laughs> So was there something you wanted to talk about with this page or these sets of pages, Gail, um, yeah, just about yeah. those shapes? Um, so here, here I put up the first three pages of um, Chrissy's Big Day. Um, and basically what I want to show you is um, I'll always try to introduce a scene, get people like in the space. This is where we are. You are, um, you, you are now here. Um, I try to keep my panel layouts fairly straightforward, maybe three to seven panels for the most part. Mm -hmm. They're um, clear, legible. I, As much as possible, I try to mark a clear flow from balloon to balloon. Like you can see the way you're supposed to move your eye across the page. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, I'm trying to do everything I can to get out of my own way in terms of storytelling. Like mm -hmm. if I'm putting a balloon um, on the top of a panel and the bottom of the other part of the panel, and I have a panel, uh, a balloon in the panel right underneath it, I'm scared that you're going to go down instead of across the panel you're supposed to be at next. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, in terms of style, this is pretty much my own natural style, but I think that 
what makes it kid friendly um, in my own eyes is that mm, my shapes are kind of soft, appealing, childlike in that kind of like baby face sort of way. And mm -hmm. I try to give myself room to ha experience big emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I really like pushing expressions and actions mm -hmm. to show you and try to get you into what they're feeling. Um, like I really like just making real goofy faces. So it's very fun to watch me draw. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And again, with the balloons, you can kind of see like where I was trying to put you like towards that last panel at the end. Um, Benji, also, because you brought up manga a couple of times, and I think I'd actually connect that. I always want to talk about manga. Um, <laughs> See, but I think you, yeah, you, like, connecting that to what Gail has just mentioned about broadness of expression, mm -hmm. I think one of the things I think about with manga and humor, but also expression in general, is that there's a lot more permission of exaggeration. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's always clear mm -hmm. when a character is angry because they have the little vein yeah. on the side, yeah. or, yeah. like, they have the big tears when they're upset and stuff like that, and it's felt very clear to me what was going on, and I don't know if you guys feel similarly, because yeah. I don't know, I know you read a ton, Shannon. I don't know how much Boy. Monday, um, you read Molly, but just thinking about those things, do you yeah. think, do yeah. you find that that's the case? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. It was also interesting going into this project because um, I read a lot of manga growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so I was used to seeing stuff like the um, eternal sweat drop. Like yeah. you just kind of know what that means. Mm -hmm. So I, um, when I got started, I would put them into my pages and my editor would come back like, yeah, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm um, trying to find ways to um, translate back to something um, very broadly accessible to Western audiences, mm -hmm. um, as well as cut down on my shoujo bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real journey. <laughs> well, I mean, if My Hero Academia is one of the most read comics in the right. U.S., <laughs> should you necessarily be doing that? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. my thinking is as more people are reading stuff like My Hero, that distinction is going to mm -hmm. go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of the question of the cycle of signifiers, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I've never read a lot of manga and I'm getting into it recently. Um, and it's so... Welcome. It's, <laughs> I, it's like, I, I feel like that jerk who's like, who's like, have you guys heard of <laughs> manga? Like, it's so... You're like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Like, have you heard about this comic? And have you heard? It's amazing because like it is like it's so many. It's like I feel like everyone I've come up with grew up with it, and like I'm seeing it like translated into like mm -hmm. everyone's unique styles. And so it's mm -hmm. I'm familiar with some of it, but it is just like this understanding that the page is like the words and the drawings are not separate. Like a drawing can become something that's almost a symbol that's almost just like an emoji, yeah. and the words can form things that are almost drawings. And like it's it's I mean it's like. Yeah, Scott McCloud talks about it a lot, but it's like, it is that really exciting space where I think like Western superhero comics was like, you do this beautiful rendering and then the bubbles are pasted on and it's like really cool. I think manga seems to like approach it as a flow, mm -hmm. which yeah, is very exactly. natural. It's like a whole piece, mm -hmm. like it's a whole, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not like, like, like you've pasted in a page from your prose novel like on top of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I'm getting, ex I'm interested in like, I'm trying to build, bring that into my work more yes. mm -hmm. as I'm, Ooh, that's an interesting distortion. Ooh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's not what the page looks like. <laughs> no, that's so, we got, that's, so oh, that's something we have, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we could talk about at least this page. Is there <laughs> something you want to talk about aside from the surprise distortion? <laughs> that's so weird. Is that the only page? Yeah, I think that's the only one they oh, have, I said, unfortunately. Like yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, that's so strange. I don't strange. know. We'll see if there's some at the end. That's but. okay. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah. It fast forwarded. Mm. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. There. Yeah, it is. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm still. Yeah, I'm still. I'm still learning. Like, I drew this comic a couple of years ago, so I feel like I'm developing since then. But yeah, it's just fun. I think the scene that I sent was kind of like a spooky scene in the middle of the book because mm -hmm. I was just thinking about like how I really loved scary stuff when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But I would. I was a scaredy cat also, so I wanted like kind of scary stuff, but not too scary mm -hmm. um, and like I like I really loved um, spooky scenes in, in kids books that would like tiptoe me right up to the edge mm -hmm. so yeah so how do you structurally yeah. limit that how do you get them to the point of scary but not too scary yeah it's a good question I mean I think it is like there's ways that you can bring out the feeling like I love to have like all black panel gutters like for those of you who don't know that's just like um, on that the right hand page it's where everything in between the panels is black because it, it makes you feel like you're in the nighttime um, yeah, and just like like bringing in these scary shapes 
Um, like, shape language is a big thing. Like, the really simple version is like, round shapes are friendly and pointy shapes are mean. Um, <laughs> and so bringing in like those scary pointy shapes, um, mm -hmm. like even like, you can see like the rambles and things that the character's running into. Um, uh, just like, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like, like you were talking about with the black gutters, it works really well for that because like, mm -hmm. as you move moment to moment across the page, like the black is encroaching. Yeah. Like that would be terrifying mm -hmm. to challenge me. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> I mean, and just from here, it appears like the branches are black mm -hmm. as well as like the actual panel. So like the panel gradations for those three are become part of the branches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And totally. I think that works super well in terms of like, in addition to what Gail is saying, is like creating that encroaching space, mm -hmm. yeah. that sense of like claustrophobia that I think all kids understand. Yeah. Like being stuffed in a locker, not that I would know oh anything about that. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. And then <laughs> Shannon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So I'm like, like uh, Jam mentioned, I'm definitely inspired by manga and anime. And the thing that like got me going was just all the emphasis and focus on expressions. And God, I loved it. I loved this stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it was just, I, I read a lot of Naruto, and I read a yes. lot of um, uh, Yotsuba and Nichijo, and just, I, that, that was my thing, Dragon Ball Z and like Dragon Ball. And there was always like an emphasis on, uh, again, expressions, and this is what's happening. Like you can obviously like feel like, what, what, <laughs> mom, what? <laughs> Why are you doing this to us? <laughs> Do you think that like the like big eyes are just like I just feel like it's this universal like I feel like my eyes have gotten like the eyes that I draw have gotten bigger, bigger. over the course bigger. of my career because it just is it's just you can get so much more expensive. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Another thing where it's like have you guys heard of <laughs> 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 characters with very big eyes? <laughs> it's like that progression of Mickey where like he starts off one way and oh, yeah. he's like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting because people attribute the big eyes. I mean, if you know, you're that girl who's like reading manga and they're like, oh, I can tell that's Japanese because the eyes are very big. And you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of the thing where it comes from is at least what I've understood, but I've never actually gone back and fact checked, is that it does come back from Disney a little bit too, and it's mm -hmm. been very cyclical. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, it has somehow become specifically attributed to manga mm -hmm. and like Japanese things. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's kind of an emotional, I mean, I don't know if that's totally, like, do you feel like that's the case, Molly? Yeah, no, you're no, like, no, I, no, I was just thinking, I, was, I never put those together. I feel like Disney was, um, I can't, I'm trying to think of if there's any like early Disney characters with the really big manga eyes, because I feel mm. like it's more like cartoon animals. Yeah. It was like the Western version, and then like manga was like more, more human figures with mm -hmm. those proportions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it still comes back to like emotion, like deciding yeah. that these eyes need to yeah. get bigger and yeah. bigger. And you bigger can and convey bigger. so many things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just like a whole world in their eyes. Yeah. 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 The I eyes mean, are the windows to the soul. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the whole soul. All of it. <laughs> but I think that's huge because even the way this page is structured mm -hmm. is like those eyes are right. That's yeah. what you want them to look yeah. at. Yeah. It's like you're driving everything towards that center. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That soul. And then was there something you wanted to chat about with, with this page, Shannon? Oh yeah, so this is another example of like, I'm introducing the mother and stuff. So we have a full body um, image of her. So there's just that focus on she's important. Uh, that's where the page is starting. And again, um, this is based on my life, any, any kid's life where you're just nagging your mother, just like, um, we're supposed to do this. Can we do this? I know you're tired, but please, <laughs> please let us do this. And like, she's obviously frustrated. And then there's just always bickering. Like, my I have a younger brother, and he's a year younger than me. And my mom talks about all the time how it was like practically we were twins <laughs> because we were just like on top of each other, just like talking over each other and just bickering. It's just like, well, I didn't want that. I didn't want this. Yada 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 yada. It's just like a back and forth that uh, I love seeing in work in terms of like siblings. So I tried to get that in this page and she's obviously getting more upset. <laughs>
Could you talk a little bit about the actual layout of this page? Because one of the things I think is remarkable about it, at least in the way that I think we colloquially sometimes talk about kids' comics, is that layouts have to be very simple, mm -hmm. and that they have to be very straightforward. Mm -hmm. And what I like about this is that there's clear variety in mm -hmm. the way that you've set, up, set it up, even though there are rows. Mm -hmm. And additionally, I mean, you've kind of got this little bit of a the, the holy grail of the nine-panel grid going on, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I think this could easily be an adult comic, as I recognize it yeah. but knowing the material it could also be a child's comic yeah so I'd love to hear you talk about the way you did layouts and I'm I'm gonna assume that manga was the yeah <laughs> was the it, it was the the thing is like I went into it with like um manga in mind but a lot of this stuff is by accident I remember <laughs> showing my roommate and he was like oh I like how you transition from here to here and here did you mean to do that and I was like yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, I did. Um, I, I think as I'm getting better with comics, like it's just like instinct now. It's just this works. This is how I can read it. Is does this read really well? And I wanted to have the scene where they're in the kitchen, but then there's an emphasis on them. And I think there's such a strength in like the same panel, but only slight things changing, um, so you can uh, get this build up and. Yeah, I, thanks. I didn't even think about the nine panel thing. Well, I think it really works because I think what's clear in this is like you trust your reader. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I trust really my reader trust to get what's reader. going on. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that's another thing that um, I'm trying to do in my comics is I trust my reader. I trust that they're going to fill in the blanks, that they're going to get it. Um, I have a lot of confidence in people in general. Maybe I shouldn't, but, <laughs> but I do. I <laughs> think something that's great about young readers, too, is like, I mean, I, I would reread books constantly when yeah. I was a kid. And if I, I'd had comics, I would have reread them. I think it's like, you can trust that someone's going to like, because yeah. I feel like I also like, I'll see kids like read my comic in, in 20 minutes. Yeah. But I, I trust that they're going to read it again and like oh, yeah. get pick up on more stuff each time. Yeah. And like adults, kids love to problem solve if they didn't get get it the first go around, I'm going to read it again. Mm -hmm. And I always learn something new or see something different each each read. So, Benji, you want to talk about some Catboy? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to move the microphone towards you so you just you can look at it and also okay. talk? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what to say about Catboy. Uh, these pages were really rough, but um, yeah, no. Uh, I I try to use really flat colors all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's like really clear that way. Mm -hmm. And like my um, my text is big because I write it on paper. Mm -hmm. But also I, I think people like it because they can actually read it. I think a lot of times text is like a little too small. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Um, what else can I say about Catboy? <laughs> I mean, I'd also like to hear there's about... There's more Catboy. Yeah, there's more Catboy. Like, Catboy had... I think he's... Does he still have his name on his forehead? Yeah. Henry. Mm -hmm. and yeah, his name's Henry. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I actually really liked that choice of it because it seemed very, like, kind of the sweat drop yeah. sort of, like, moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what's cool about it, and, and I guess what... Again, what I feel like we end up understanding and kind of what you guys were describing about, like, emoji and things like that is the understanding that that's not permanent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like kids will intuitively understand that Henry is not actually literally written yeah, on this person's right. forehead, yeah. but it becomes part of the narrative. Um, I just thought that was really cool. And yeah. did you think about that at all? And it's okay if you say yes. And then <laughs> I thought answer. about it briefly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's. I, I just thought it was going to be like a interesting way to. Sometimes it's on the back of his head, and it's like a thought kind of thing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's just, it was me experimenting with trying to do like a manga-like signifier mm -hmm. or something that wasn't like a sweat drop. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think what I like about having your comics kind of towards the end is, and I don't know if you guys will feel similarly, but to me, this is indistinguishable from the other three things that we've seen so far. Like, I yeah. wouldn't necessarily have been like without going through and reading the comic, oh, this one definitely is in Vice, whereas this one yeah. is sold yeah. at Scholastic Book Fairs yeah. exclusively to children. <laughs> and I think that that's really remarkable and cool. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I wanted to ask, I think it was, oh no, 
Um, I think it was this one, um, just the setups for the panels too. Um, I just thought it was really like interesting, like the transition from night to day, and it's I like bam, that. there we are. <laughs> and it's and it's very similar to kind of the stuff we were talking about before with like children's comics, is that this language is all the same, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And just how we're wielding it actually seems like it's a lot more arbitrary than we really think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's. It's really interesting with this comic. I've gotten a lot of messages from people saying, "I've never read a comic before, but I love your comics." And mm -hmm. it's like, "Oh, so you just needed to be able to read something?" Yeah. That was just you more needed obvious. a yeah, like an access point. Yeah. 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 I used to think like people used to complain about being able to read manga because they're like, "Oh, I never read it before, and it's just hard to read compared to other comics." And I'm like, "You're being lazy." <laughs> um, but then there was actually a really interesting thread on Twitter going by a long time ago about like how you actually oh, know yeah, to read, like read, yeah, read, the panel. read right. down and read over yeah. Yeah. that you intuitively learn when you keep reading and then I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's okay, I forgive time. you all. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think that's actually really cool and what we were talking about before kind of, of do we need more adult things kind of in this vein that makes it more accessible to the public too? Like how else can we use these signifiers and does it actually, it'll help both ways to expand them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's just this specialness to like remembering that comics are a unique medium. It's not an animated show that was then frozen mm -hmm. yeah. at certain key frames. It's, it's it, it is, you have yeah. this. Yeah, cinema. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is like, it is print and it is, mm -hmm. exists in book form and like a really, it's just it's just very much its own thing and I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of yeah. Like yeah. what we can do with the medium. Because I think even with adult animation, I think part of the implicit joke of the animation every single time um, is that it's a cartoon and cartoons are, so, are supposed to be for children yeah. and therefore it's funny that we're lewd. Yeah, right. like right. very tired of that. Like, yeah. yeah, and, and I Muppet movie like that. Oh, Whoa, God. yeah, but I'm like you know, like Family Guy. Family Guy, yeah, yeah. 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 and it's like or even I think Bojack Horseman is like mm -hmm. that too. Even though I think there's a lot more expansion about like mm -hmm. the complexity of things mm -hmm. that are dealt with in Bojack Horseman, um, but I think that's still kind of the understood thing, and we're still in that space where cartoons are still for kids and comics are still for kids and so work like Benji's is really I think mm -hmm. pushing that out into not only can they be for adults you can still create them in the shape of children's comics and they mm -hmm. still can be for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Good job Benji. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've touched on nostalgia I think mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. pretty great deal and I think that inevitably is part of these signifiers because I mean it's like anything else the reason we end up acting like our parents is because the way that we learn to be adults is from our parents. Yeah. Yeah. It's inevitable. Um, and so talking about it, so one doesn't usually get to make them well until you're like past your childhood as we discussed, but it kind of plays a role in anything that anybody makes. But I feel like the difference in children's works is that they require a more practical form of nostalgia in, in mm -hmm. a way, because like nostalgia is part of everything, mm -hmm. but you kind of have to think back to like, you know, what you enjoyed, like what you wanted back then, um, or, and maybe never found, and that may be like kind of an impetus for your work. Do you guys find that to be the case with the stuff that you do? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's funny. It seems like I, I also work in uh, children's animation, so I like have a lot of like coworkers who just are all we're all in this space where we're trying to. And I've noticed that it's it's either people making work for their child selves or for their children. Mm -hmm. Like it mm -hmm. almost like depends on like if you're a parent or not. Yeah. Because like all the parents I know who like like are writers or animators are kind of like. This well, this is what my daughter likes, and so like this this is my avenue in. But yeah, I definitely just try to access what I loved, and like mm -hmm. I feel like I've always um, like the Witch Boy was like a little difficult to pitch because it it it, do, it doesn't have that like kind of like funny kids comic like look to it so mm -hmm. much. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's not like a funny comic. It's not super cartoony, mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't as much of that a couple of years ago. There's like there's so much awesome mm -hmm. stuff now, but so that was like. But I was like, I never liked comics like that, like, mm -hmm. and no shade on them. I just like, I couldn't like, that was not my thing. I wanted like the really cool epic fantasy stuff, and mm -hmm. so like, can I can I make that for myself? Yeah, I, I my goal, my goal going to, um, forward has always been. Uh, I read a lot of Slice of Life, and I thought the humor was hilarious. <laughs> so now I'm just like working towards making that work that I wanted to see. And um, yeah, uh, nostalgia comes into play. Um, like summers, summers with like my grandparents or uh, school nights or just a lot of like video game nostalgia comes into play. So 
I, I definitely can tell, <laughs> I can definitely tell like a, a creator um, is bringing in that nostalgia when I see like little like trinkets and stuff. Mm. They're just like, <laughs> you're like, is that, uh, is that clown? <laughs> like like, when, like that Steven Universe thing. I was oh, like, oh my. Sonic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know who's making this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that like um, nostalgia for things you liked uh, is a big factor, but also reaching back to who you were and what mm -hmm. you would have needed as a person yeah. ends up being a very big factor as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. My, my sense of nostalgia is really only aesthetic for most of my work, since yeah. it's not all ages, technically. But um, I've, I've messed around with all ages comics briefly that I did not finish. But yeah, uh, I like what I would try to do to put myself back into the place of like things that I wanted as a child and like things that mattered to me when I was a kid is I would like look at pictures of where I grew up and mm -hmm. like I think it's really important to try to like put yourself in that place for mm -hmm. probably any kind of work mm -hmm. just to be more connected to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I realized, um, I was having a conversation with um, a cartoonist who uh, really works in kids' comics, Kathy, who's in the audience. Kathy! Uh, and and um, we were talking about the fact that um, I actually really enjoy children's comics, like young kids' comics, and I really enjoy middle grade comics, and I, I get really hung up at YA for mm -hmm. some reason. And I realized just now that I think going back to the nostalgia of it, as a kid, I would read kids' comics, and kind of at the age of middle grade, I would read middle grade comics or fiction or what have you, and then I would probably still try to read above. And mm -hmm. by the time I was the age of YA, my nostalgia, like my moment at, of being a YA age is trying to read adult mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. So when I try to get back there, my actual feeling when I hit that age is to not read that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, um, I think actually my question would ultimately be, how do you guys decide, age-wise, what audience you're gonna write for um, or gonna create comics for? And um, do you guys have any of that? I can't for like <laughs> any of those ages, or is that just my weirdness? <laughs> hmm. um, well, I was just drawing comics that like I probably would have read as a kid. I, mm -hmm. I liked adult leaning, like I. I would read all these adult books about mm -hmm. like murders because <laughs> my parents just thought I was reading and it, was, <laughs> and it wasn't, so they didn't real. think it was scandalous. <laughs> but uh, so I, I just like, uh, I've always just leaned towards that stuff. And um, I guess that's kind of all I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. I thought I had more to say. <laughs> Someone else? <laughs> I do think it's pretty like like commonly accepted that like you do, like kids want to read up a bit. So you want to read mm -hmm. if, you, if you're like eight, you want to read about a twelve year old. Mm -hmm. um, and so like there's that factor. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's so funny. I would read like the craziest adult yeah. books when yeah. I was young. And so it's kind of like, can you make something that almost like appeals to that side of it, but is actually uh, mm -hmm. appropriate? I'm working yeah. on a, a, a sort of a YA book right now, and I. I it's like romance, and so I feel like I want it to be this like classic teen romance, but I, I keep skewing it really young. I think I'm just like used to that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like often the kind of story that you're telling, well, like with The Witch Boy, I kind of just thought it was would be a YA book, and then my editor was like, this is really a story about identity, it's about family conflict, it's about finding like your first friends, and that's a middle grade story. Like that's just where that age, like mm -hmm. that's what's relatable at that time. So it's kind of interesting, I think YA is like, a little bit more of you like struggling against a system or mm -hmm. like coming Breaking into your own free. as an adult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's diff yeah, it's different stories for different age groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 While the two of them think, um, <laughs> we have two microphones set up so once they answer you guys can start getting your oh questions Lord. going, but I just want people to queue up, so oh but God. Uh, Shannon yeah. you go. You guys I'm got to. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything to say that hasn't already been said. Yeah, it's like very, very well put. Yeah, um, good job, yeah. guys. Yeah, I think like I definitely feel comfortable in in the story space I am right now because mm -hmm. they are stories I am personally interested in telling. Like I gravitate very strongly towards um, stories about friendship or learning mm -hmm. to communicate with other people or yeah. um, you know like growing as a person mm -hmm. that fits very smoothly into this child space that I am inhabiting. Yeah, middle grade is middle grade's a, a nice right. Yeah, it's a, yeah, like a nice yeah. space to work with. Like exactly. it's yeah. a lot of confusion, a lot of things are changing, mm -hmm. and 
I, I like try to harp back to like where was I at like 12? Like what was I trying to figure out? Like what friends was I trying to make or what like hurdles was I trying to get over? And it's just interesting trying to tackle that in your comics and books and whatnot. So yeah. 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 Like everything's so new. It's like yeah. everything gets to be a discovery and yeah. very um, like exciting, which works well for a story. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes on like YA, you're like, oh, I've already been there. Yeah. What yeah. else do I have to say? Or it's, yeah, it's almost like a little too close to your real life. Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, oh, this is too familiar. <laughs> well, I feel like that's a that's why I like doing stuff that's usually. Um, like early 20s because that's also another period of like oh yeah that's like a new yeah, thing yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's like oh now you have to get a job you have to get an apartment <laughs> you have to be an adult yeah, yeah. that's a great point yeah, yeah. yeah. it's the same it's the same as uh, middle grade yeah <laughs> <laughs> just you know bills <laughs> all right so questions we have one over here um, you guys were talking a lot about telling children's stories as adults, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of tropes in, in children's work where like kids are going off and having an adventure, and when you're reading it as a kid, you're like, yeah, let's get them reading it as an adult. You're like, where's your grown-up? <laughs> um, <it's laughs> where are the parents? Right? <laughs> uh, where's your supervision? Where's the teachers? Where's Dumbledore? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's why they're like always you're, an orphan. You're yeah, you're a kid. Has to like so <laughs> as an adult trying to tell children's stories, like, is it ever hard to be like, you want to put that adult supervision in, or like you're worried about these characters, or like how do you work around that as a creator? Like telling kids stories where like that's not actually safe for a kid. <laughs> I mean, I, I imagine you'd have to just like suspend, like kids are way better at suspending disbelief. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Catboy, the girl makes a wish on a star to turn her cat into a person. And I trust that 20 year olds can also suspend disbelief for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, kids, kids, kids don't need context. <laughs> they love no context. Yeah. They don't want details. <laughs> It is interesting, though. I mean, I think about this a lot with my book um, because it, I really did want it to be like grounded in a family, and that, but then to have these kids go off and do things that are maybe dangerous, and of course the adults can't be there. And it is, it's like a, a tension between like what you wanted to do as a kid, like the adventures you wanted to go on and the freedom that you wanted to have versus like, are you going to make something relatable where you actually don't have that kind of freedom? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's very interesting and generational. I was talking to some people in animation recently who where like kids recently want stories that are more um, uh, like that have guardians in them in some way. Like there is this like anxiety, which is like makes me very sad. But they were like, we were working on this show about an island where there's no adults and it's all children. And they were testing it, and all the kids were like, but where, where's the parent? Like I'm nervous about this. And and so it's it's interesting. It's mm -hmm. it's a really interesting place to like you have some freedom for adventure, but yeah to also recognize the reality of life when you're young, that there are people who are, yeah. are keeping track of you. I'm wondering if um, that whole question of kids asking like where the guardians are coming from and like where are they in the stories has anything to do with like generational things where parents are getting more involved in asking their uh, kids like, what do you wanna do, what's happening? Cause mm -hmm. I can definitely see that coming into play where you have kids that are just like, no, I like my parents being here cause they're not and mean them here or something. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then also that level of structure in a kid's life now as opposed to when we were growing up. Oh yeah, up, definitely. Yeah, like I went outside all day. Yeah, all day. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was an inside child. <laughs> but I mean, I was an inside, inside child reading the boxcar children mm -hmm. and Hatchet, which is all like, everyone read Hatchet. <laughs> and like, I you know, Hatchet. all these stories about kids getting just separated from adults mm -hmm. and like kind of figuring it out or famous five if you're yeah. in the Blighton clan and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but the one thing I would want to add on and kind of shift mm -hmm. would be too, Batman's an orphan, yeah. right? <laughs> like Batman's out here doing all kinds of stuff that he's not supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and like how, <laughs> and everyone's like, where are your parents that dead? Um, and I do think that that's part of though, mm -hmm. like kind of, because the question of who's your guardian and is that what allows these mm -hmm. things is definitely part of what I think makes a lot of these narratives mm -hmm. interesting. It makes them work because the only yeah. guardian he has is someone he literally pays. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I think that also is kind of part of the child's fantasy of Batman where he's like, I have a dad, but he's my butler. <laughs> <laughs> oh and my it's God. very interesting, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. 
Alfred. Shout right? out to yeah. Alfred. <laughs> Or went out for her. <laughs> um, but it is such a classic, I mean, it's such a classic trope of like an orphan's protagonist. And I think it's like, when you think about like the hero's journey and this idea where you like go into this space that is not normal and you become someone who does things that no one else does. And to do that, you almost like, it's hard to then also have ties to the world. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm really interested. I'm interested in like, how do you tell those stories where it's mm -hmm. an adventure and you're a hero and you're out of the ordinary, but also you are connected to family and to mm -hmm. friends, because um, yeah. just like most of us are, like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because like ideally, like parents are that safe space that you know you can always come back to. Mm -hmm. So like to be able to tell a story where they are the safe place, but are also encouraging you to be yourself and go out there yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not the safe space, like yeah. in like Jared's also book, true, Hey yeah. Kiddo, like, <laughs> yeah. is all about having unsafe parents, and that's mm -hmm. exactly really interesting too, because yeah. that's a real anxiety and something yeah. a lot of people really have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question over here? Yeah, um, this might end up being more of a technical question, but how do you know what kids respond to and what kids like more than just like remembering what your, your childhood was like and what you liked? Is it mostly just like trying to write what you would have needed as a child or is there actual ways of like hearing what children like to write stories what children might want to hear and also like once you've written it, how do you know if it's inappropriate you know, or like uh, digestible for them? Mm. I think uh, a lot of it is like kids responding, like just being at SPX right now, mm -hmm. um, having a lot of kids come by and like, ooh, I like the way this person looks. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, I'll keep doing this. <laughs> and just again, like uh, you mentioned, um, it has to do with like things that I thought was cool. Like I wish my fashion was a little bit more free when I was in middle school. <laughs> so I guess I'm like trying to like live through that in my my book. I'm like, yeah, let's let's wear yellow and green and and, and pink for some reason. <laughs> let's do it. Armpits all up my arm. Let's do it. Um, but but yeah, um, I think a lot of it has to uh, do with like kids responding to things and they're just like, yeah, I, I, I wear that outfit a lot and yeah, that like goes into your comic and whatnot. Um, sorry, I kind of like Yeah, I got, guess just like, yeah. yeah. Um, like, I guess keep an eye out for real kids in the real world. Yeah. Um, like, th this is terrible, but I do like to go to my local coffee shop around the time when school gets out and sit back and listen to the hot goss. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like, get kind of like having a handle on just like how kids are talking, what they're into. Um, yeah. Like, it's, kids are wild. If if you can <laughs> access that, they are. <laughs> yeah, like I have to like walk by this uh, like young like elementary school to go to our coffee shop, and they're out on a blacktop, and I'm just like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think conventions are a really good way to gauge what mm -hmm. people are interested in. Too. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think you're right, Shannon. You yeah. touched on that a minute ago. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, no, like kids pick up things that they like, and they're yeah. like, "This is what I like about it," and they'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they won't. Or if they don't. Like yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's or true. Or they just say, "I don't like this." No, I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's just, there's a lot of like received wisdom about like what makes a kid's property mm -hmm. that I think is uh, kind of bunk. And like, I guess, I also am like still in the animation perspective where people will be like, there's a character who's older in this. Like, she's like an old woman. So like, kids don't care about that. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, we would, you know, that, that's kids so, love it's so grandmas. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and to be like, just to be like, like, Sometimes people, I think, have lost touch with like mm -hmm. what they actually were obsessed with um, mm -hmm. yes. when they were young. But so to, to understand that, yeah, there's this, there's a lot of like, especially gendered ideas about like, this is a girl's story and this is a boy's story. Mm -hmm. um, like these are the things that people, the kids will respond to. And like, they're partially based on reality, but it also is like a really small box that like you can definitely think outside of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we gotta wrap this up, yeah. so. To uh, just close out, why don't we start at the end with Benji and just tell us, you know, where people can find you uh, oh, at Benji. the show going oh, forward. Uh, I'm on Benji. table J2 uh, with Silver Sprocket. Buy all their books. I got Catboy. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Catboy Volume 2 is coming out next year. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, yeah, I am at table H6. It's closer to one of the walls across from Ngozi from Czech, please. Um, H6, okay, got it. Um, I'm at E11, um, <laughs> next to Richie, he has a brick on his table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I'm at W9. Uh, it's right against the wall next to a door. <laughs> <laughs> There's balloons. Like it took oh, me yeah. like a, a whole year yeah. to figure out what those were for. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's a blue balloon yeah. hovering. Well, thanks to all the panelists and thank you guys for coming. Thank you.